Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of the Xander Drew series and founder at Engine Books. Let's see what we have today. Okay, well, thank you for joining us for another wonderful episode of the Write Project podcast. I know I say that they are all wonderful, but this one really is because we are on with Olivia Robinson, who is the author of uh, The Blue Moth Motel, a new book from Breakwater Books. Olivia Robinson, have you ever gone on a literary pilgrimage? Have you ever traveled with the express purpose of either writing or gaining insight into writing? I have. Um, I actually uh, was on um, Trudy Morgan Cole's podcast, um, Shelf Esteem, right before the pandemic started, so almost two years ago now. And uh, we talked about my literary pilgrimage to the UK, which I'd been planning since my undergrad. Me and a couple of friends um, went and we were going to go when we graduated from our undergrad, but then we didn't have enough money and uh, it just didn't happen. But we just kept the plans in the works um, and they humored me because uh, they're not writers. They both love um, reading, but uh, I wanted to go visit um, Virginia Woolf's house in uh, Rodmel in the UK. And I also saw a few of the um, homes where she lived in London as well. And I also wanted to go see um, her sister, Vanessa Bell's house, um, Charleston, which um, Ingrid gets to go see in the Blue Moth Motel as well. Um, So yeah, that was my literary pilgrimage because I love both. (laughs) And uh, yeah, and her sister as well. Nice. Olivia Robinson, have you ever gotten reader's block? Have you ever just, what about a book can make you put it down? What about a book? Or is there a specific book that have made you just go, nope, I'm done reading, can't read right now? Oh, um, I am usually pretty good at picking books that I know I will love (laughs) to read. Um, I'm definitely a big mood reader, so I pick up books based on the season and also what mood that I'm in so like I have to read a book that's set in the summer during the summer I can't read it during the winter yeah okay (laughs) which does uh limit my reading uh somewhat but I have so far managed very well um like if there's parts of it that are set during the summer then that's fine like if it's kind of a multi decade type like multi-generational story then um I can read it as long as I'm in the right mood to read it (laughs) okay um so I am yeah a bit of a strange reader in that regard but um I think something that would make me put down a book is if there's any like ableist language in it or any themes um yeah that are ableist or don't really have time for that type of uh, <laughs> writing and just I don't think it's uh, necessary. Um, yeah, they'll do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, but I, yeah, I rarely, um, rarely put down a book. Okay. All right. I'm <laughs> pretty good at, <laughs> at choosing what I will like, but um, yeah, and I don't really get in a reading slump. Sometimes I read less than other times but um I've really been enjoying audiobooks uh, probably in the past year or so so those have really um increased the number of books that I can read because I can be reading while I'm driving as well which is like yeah the best yeah 
I, I do that as well. Um, I actually have different audiobooks depending on what task I'm doing. So I have one for mm-hmm. like being on the treadmill, one for driving that will take forever. Like I'll be reading the driving one for a year because it's 20 hours. And I only drive three hours a week. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just actually discovered the feature that you can like speed it up. Yes. <laughs> So I usually listen to it, depending on the narrator, I'll listen to it at like 1.2 or 1.3 speed. Uh, I'm a native Newfoundlander, so I've listened to it on like 2.5 speed because I'm oh like, gosh. now it's now it feels <laughs> like it's natural yeah. to me. Like, <laughs> yeah. Sounds like, man, yeah. perfect. Here we go. Perfect. We yeah. Go. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's very quick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll turn it back on and it's like, I'll like, if I start it again or something, or if I close the app, it'll go back to one speed and it feels like they're all talking like this. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Fun. Uh, Olivia Robinson, what did you edit out of this book, The Blue Mouth Motel? Is there anything that got, that made it to the cutting room floor? Oh, um, yes, I kind of mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the inspiration, um, but in uh, my thesis, uh, there was a bit, or there was uh, this piece of art um, called the 40 part motet by Janet Cardiff, um, which is a sound installation. And uh, with a choir um, with 40 members um, singing a a Thomas Tallis piece. And that unfortunately did not make it into the Blue Moth Motel because that was kind of a bit more of an overarching theme in in that novella. So that didn't really work with the Blue Moth aspect because the character in that novella um she went to the art gallery where the piece was so because I was referencing a specific piece that was in a specific art gallery like at a specific time it just didn't work out with the timeline um but I loved that piece of art and wish it could have ended up in there but <laughs> now I, always, I can talk about it and people can go online and find it <laughs> I always I always that's very respectable I always look at authors when they say stuff like that though and I'm like you know it's fiction right L- like, I know you like, can put it in I know yeah you could you could just be like oh now it was here like it was always in here like you could just move the location of that museum like there also yes. wasn't a blue moth motel <laughs> like true true yeah. <laughs> very true yeah I don't know I think because it was someone else's piece of art that uh that I saw like in a very specific context because I feel like if I had not um, encountered that in uh, like in that chapel room of the art gallery I'm not sure if the impact would have been the same so yeah it was very crucial to the story for it to be uh, in that place and I did enjoy that scene um, that I wrote but it unfortunately it still exists somewhere but I don't know if it will ever um, emerge (laughs) awesome awesome like that's a level of attention to detail that is like respectable but that I can't get my head around because the stuff (laughs) that I have just plainly been like yeah you can drive from Maine to Los Angeles in three hours sure yeah fine (laughs) fine you know what no one will notice fine oh, no. just go <laughs> um olivia robinson does writing energize you or does it exhaust you when you're done with your writing for the day is this a is an energy booster or is it just done you know um i think it depends on the type of writing day it is if it's a really good day then i'll probably end the day i don't usually write for an entire um, day, because during the writing of this, I still um, had day jobs. So um, it was kind of chunks of time. So two or three hours here and there and a few more on the weekend. So if I um, 
yeah, I had a really good chunk of writing time, then it would leave me energized. And I usually write early in the morning, kind of when I'm still uh, half asleep. So I kind of wake up as I'm writing in a way. <laughs> so it does often feel like it's more energizing than draining, which is good, I think. Good, good, good. That does sound like a good thing, for sure. Oh, that's good. These questions are fun. Yeah, I like them. Yeah, I like them. Good. I've gotten the rid other, of the bad ones. <laughs> the other interview that I had um, was with a um, woman from an online magazine that was on um, Saturday. And she also asked some really wonderful, like unique questions that um, really made me think. Uh, so yeah, I enjoy that in an interview when it's not oh. just kind of the straightforward, <laughs> like same old, uh, she, same old questions. <laughs> she, she must be a writer because like, I feel I like- think the, so. Yeah, the questions that non-writers ask writers are horrible. <laughs> yeah. What in where do you get your ideas? I don't know, Janice. Where do you get your ideas? What, what <laughs> yeah. Are, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like they are uh, nice sometimes because you do have kind of set responses to them, but um, yeah, at the same time, it is fun to uh, get to do some out of the box questions. For sure. Uh, speaking of Olivia Rob Olivia Robinson, have you ever hidden any secrets in your book, The Blue Moth Motel, or any other of your fiction that only a few people will ever find? Oh, secrets. I don't think there's any secrets in there. That's um, a good way to keep them. I don't think so. Well, actually, probably yes. <laughs> uh for uh giant secret like i don't know if secret is the right word um but probably some people like maybe in my extended family will uh realize that i am queer when this book comes out oh okay. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be like oh wow okay that might be why she never had a boyfriend growing up hmm <laughs> that's that solved but I don't know if secret uh is the right word because yeah it's not something that I keep a secret but um I am a private person I guess for the sure. most part um so it's just if it doesn't come up in conversation then I'm not gonna really bring it up um but yeah now I guess people will know <laughs> that's interesting kind of, yeah kind of a strange way to be like hello family yes i am queer yeah. <laughs> here's that's this book where all of the characters pretty much are also queer <laughs> okay. so yeah like it okay yeah yeah i would not be able to keep something like i am i am a, a, a talker i am not a private person i wish i was a private person because i would put my foot in my mouth far fewer times and embarrass <laughs> the people around me far fewer times the things that come right. out of my mouth are, are horrible. And as soon as I say them, my brain is like, why? Why would you say that? And then you try to fib and say you were lying. And it's like, you weren't. Everyone knows you weren't. You don't know how to lie. Yeah, it's. Uh, I definitely think a lot before I talk, which is why doing some of these interviews, uh, I enjoy doing them, but it is tricky because sometimes there's a lot of... Uh, quiet time where I'm thinking of a good answer but these help me get better at uh not thinking on the spot but actually uh saying what I'm thinking what what, what is that like I don't know how to think before you be what's, it's kind of it can be tiring <laughs> and also a lot of times people think uh yeah it can like at parties and stuff it's not super great and I just end up sitting in the corner quietly because I'm thinking too much and there's never a point in the conversation where I can say something because the conversation has already moved on yeah so but beer helps with that uh <laughs> so <laughs> that uh tends to make me talk a bit more freely but um yeah, it is tricky in those types of social situations, but uh, people who know me know that I do think a lot before I 
actually speak so that'd be horrible with someone like me because i'm a, a a nervous jabberer so like right. any 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 like i would silence I, you would <laughs> any silence i will fill with inane insanity so like you would hate me because you'd never get the chance to speak i would and you'd, no, you'd no, accuse me of good. interrupting you no, like, no that's good because then i don't have to speak <laughs> so if someone else is speaking perfect <laughs> that's yeah. excellent horrible horrible um olivia robinson how do you select the names of your characters oh the names of my characters so i had a few um friends read early drafts of boom off motel and my sister was actually one of those readers and she said that she didn't like any of the character names and that i should change them all <laughs> But at this point, it was too late in the process, so none of them got changed. Wow. <laughs> but, thanks, <yeah>. sis. <laughs> no, that's why I love sending stuff to her, because she tells me how it is and gives very good feedback. Um, so that was one suggestion I did not take, but many of her other suggestions were very helpful, and I did take those. <laughs> but I kind of, I like reading books where um, the character names are memorable. I feel like I can get a clearer picture of the character based on their name. And that's kind of a fun thing about writing is that um, you can kind of create a character's name that fits their personality. Whereas with real people, like that's not really possible. And yet um, people do. Sometimes the, it the is. Number... I know you. Do. people fit their names for sure. And No, but I, um... I can't get over people who are like, like, I have a very common name, Matthew, you know what I mean? But I've absolutely met people who are like, uh, we can't be friends and I can't speak to you because I had an ex named Matthew once and he was horrible. So now I don't speak <laughs> Matthews anymore. I'm like, really? there's a right. lot of us. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. So I guess people do. Uh, um, but yeah, so I kind of like that idea of a name also indicating um, personality. So like in terms of Ingrid and Nora, you kind of get a bit of a sense of who they might be as people based on their names. Um, and then, yeah, the other names are just names that I like. I think I do have some kind of uh, I don't know, standard names, but like common names, there's the word, some more common names in there, but most of the main characters have pretty um, unique names and maybe names also can be an indicator, yeah, for personality. And then as an author, I don't have to maybe give as many, like spell out the character as much as I would have if they just kind of had a more common name. Okay. Maybe, I'm not sure. So I kind of, the name is a clue for the reader and then they can fill in a little bit from there. The names yeah. actually, uh, the Ingrid and Nora names actually like messed me up for a little bit at the start of the novel, but not in a bad way. I, I because of the losing the voice and I knew from like the back matter that like that, that that happened uh and then the names ingrid ignora i immediately just went like okay cool this is a fairy tale because they sound like very fairy tale-y names and just started to read like the for the first two chapters i was reading it like in a beatrix potter kind of voice it's like right. <laughs> ingrid and nora went to the blue moth motel to get oh, some <laughs> Get some brambleberries. Right. Yeah. It's like, no, it's not that at all. Stop it. No. Get that voice out of your head. <laughs> oh, dear. It might be interesting in that voice. Who knows? It would. We could do a children's edit. It'd be horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. It. Um, I can see how it would be a little confusing because. Um, no, I'm just being glib. <laughs> no, because the sections like the parts that take place in the UK are in the first person, whereas the parts that take place in um, PEI uh, are in the third person. So yep. um, I kind of did that uh, more to help myself than anything else. <laughs> but I hope, uh, like, I think it's 
clear to the reader that, um, yeah, Ingrid is the one in the UK uh, sections. For but, sure. Yeah. That's wonderful. Olivia Robinson, what is your favorite underappreciated novel? A novel that everyone else seems to not like, but you think is okay. Oh, that's a very good question. Underappreciated. Um, oh gosh. I have a giant list of novels that I've written down. <laughs> <laughs> or just like author's names for like, I just have a document that says media prep. And it's basically just like the names of novels so that I actually remember some names of novels when asked questions like this. Awesome. Um, but I don't know if there's any underrated or underappreciated. Um, so I do... I read a lot of queer fiction um, and there's a novel um, called The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, um, which I think came out in the 1950s. And really? then, yeah, and there was a film adaptation of it released in 2015 um, called Carol. So I don't think it's, uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't call it an underappreciated novel, but it's maybe a more or a less well-known um, novel, but it is wonderful. And if you really like atmospheric, uh, it's set during the winter, so it's a perfect uh, novel to read. It's over the Christmas season. Um, Which is the only time you can read a Christmas novel, apparently. It is. <laughs> it is for me. <laughs> so it's one that I... Uh, reread and uh, recommend to people as one they may not have uh, heard of before but I feel like since the film it's slightly more well known now but I, I have not heard of that and I've been reading a lot of um, I, I, I for a while for the last like two years I feel like I've been reading in my bubble a lot like like just like more fiction that's like fiction of it because of the way like Amazon and Goodreads recommends and they just recommend stuff that's like what you've already done and those are my main ways that I discover new books yeah I've been feeling this um I, I was hanging out with my friend's daughter and she's um she's she's a young woman now and is a voracious reader and has been really into a lot of queer fiction herself and so we started a little mini book club and I'm adoring it like I'm just getting all these things I've never heard of before into my book diet again I'm, I'm really enjoying it it's fun that's awesome it's so good yeah I love that type of book club yeah I try to yeah I try to read because I do definitely have uh things that I like to read about um so I do try to read like I um did read a bit more like sci-fi and fantasy-esque books over last winter and would love to uh, explore those genres a bit more because I really enjoyed the books that I read so yeah I was uh I went through a kick the the only times that I've actually given up on books uh not that happened often but I I looked up a list like the BBC's top 100 sci-fi novels I was like I'm gonna read all these and some of them were really great and i discovered authors that i never would have before like like uh the time traveler's wife and flowers for algernon and most of yeah. robert heinlein even though he's a trash human i like his writing but like so, man some of those i could not get into <laughs> like yeah. no matter how hard i tried <laughs> yeah and his um, lists are fun yeah for sure for sure Olivia Robinson, what is the most difficult part of your artistic process? Oh, most difficult part. Um, I learned writing this uh, while I was writing this novel that uh, I'm really bad at timelines. So oh. mostly dates. <laughs> so I know uh, my wonderful editors, um, Claire, uh, Wilkshire and Sue McLeod. Oh my gosh, if I didn't have them, 
I, yeah, this novel would be a disaster because we were discovering things during the editing process that it was like, hold on, what year is this? How old are they here? <laughs> it was like, my brain was just like, ah, I can't do dates. It was so bad um, because yeah, the, so I don't think if I ever write another novel that I will write one that is quite as uh, focused on like age and date because the sisters are so close in age. Um, that the year that things are happening like it does matter what age they are and okay that yeah sounds um silly to say but it really took a lot of brain power <laughs> for me that, to that sounds horrible <laughs> for me to be like okay this at this time she would be this old and then nora would be this old and it's this date and like Ah. <laughs> so without Claire and Sue, it would have just been a mess, but it's, uh, thanks to them, it is all in order. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So chapter three, but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Oh, awesome. This is, if you can't answer this one, that is fine, because uh, it's something that's like a specific, you know what I mean? Okay. Um, Olivia Robinson, in your opinion, uh, what are the ethics of writing real world historical figures into your novel? Are there any ethics around it? Is there a way it should be handled or not handled? Oh, interesting. Um, I'm not sure I would ever try to write a historical character. Um, but I read an interesting novel over the summer called um, A Theater for Dreamers. I think that's what it's called. Uh, yes, A Theater for Dreamers um, by Polly Sampson. And it's set on the Greek island of Hydra during the 1960s. And Leonard Cohen is a character in the novel. But I think from what I read about the novel was that all everything that the Leonard Cohen character in the novel says are words that Leonard Cohen himself actually said. So she didn't try to invent dialogue for him. Like it was all words that he said. I think that's what I... Um, yeah, which was a really interesting, and there was not a whole lot of dialogue in this novel, like it's all very kind of um, introspective. And then there is also a, an artist in that, uh, another artist um, who I believe was also um, a real person, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, I thought the way that uh, Polly Sampson went about that was very interesting um yes that's kind of the first thing that came to mind but i'm not sure if i would ever attempt it <laughs> I, I feel like it'd be fun to go really over the top like just to like like i i don't know like just like to write a benevolent historical figure and write them as though they're a fictional supervillain you know what i mean just just way insane but that's yes. the, that's a certain vibe. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think um, I haven't read this novel, but uh, the uh, George Saunders novel, um, Lincoln and the Bardo, I think he does some interesting things in there as well. I believe it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it it's can fun. definitely be done, but I don't think uh, I have the skill to do it yet. <laughs> yes okay yes <laughs> yes okay i like that answer i like it all right well thanks for coming on again for all of you we'll be here again next week at 4 30 newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in newfoundland